Hello. The reading today is taken from page 680 in the Church Bibles, and it's Song of Songs, chapter 2, or you can follow along in the booklets. So, chapter 2. She. I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. He, like a lily among thorns, is my darling among the young women. She, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest, is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Listen, my beloved, look, here he comes, leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter has passed, the rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. He, my dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside. Show me your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. She, my beloved is mine and I am his. He browses among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, turn, my beloved, and be like a gazelle or like a young stag on the rugged, rugged hills. This is the word of the Lord. Wonderful, thank you, Rachel. Um, well, hello, my name is Andy. I am uh, a new member of the team here. I am one of the uh, associate vicars, and uh, particularly a warm welcome if you're new, if you're visiting, as if someone's invited you along. We're so glad that you're here. Um, I wonder if you would think about some famous couples in, in our world. You know, those, those famous couples, I wonder who would come to mind. People like maybe Romeo and Juliet, maybe... Um, Prince William and Kate, maybe David Beckham and Victoria Beckham, Posh and Bex, I'm going to show my age, maybe Ross and Rachel from Friends, um, maybe Homer and Marge from The Simpsons, maybe more like Homer and a donut and his love for that, um, Jack and Rose from the Titanic, Mickey and Minnie Mouse. I wonder if you think about these relationships, these romantic couples that go together, and then if you take a step back and reflect and ponder about your relationship with God. I wonder if you would see it in that way. Is it, is it a love affair, a, a romantic relationship? Or maybe you'd see more as that relationship between a father and a child. Or maybe it's more like a friendship. Or maybe a kind of a satisfactory working relationship. But is it a love affair? There are some main images in scripture that um, metaphors, pictures that, that, that describe our relationship with God. Um, the main one that we probably gravitate towards too is that kind of relationship between a, a father and his children, that we're his daughters and his sons of God. Um, and even if you've got kind of baggage or kind of hang-ups about your earthly father, um, which I know many people do, but I think people generally more kind of gravitate towards that picture. Another picture is of God being kind of the master builder, that God is building his house, the church, and we get to play a part in seeing his kingdom come and his kingdom built here on earth. But another picture 
in the Bible, and if I'm completely honest, I'm pretty sure, certain I'm not the only one, one that I find slightly strange, and I've always found a little bit weird, is this picture of these two lovers, the bride and the bridegroom. Jesus, the groom, and the bride, the church. And for some people, that just feels a little bit strange, maybe for some of the, maybe for some of the blokes, but that's the big generalization. But the, you know, this image of Jesus, God, the holy God, and this kind of picture of intimacy feels maybe a little bit irreverent to speak about God in that way, that he's so set apart. But this image is throughout scripture. It's not just a few uh, lines kind of tucked away somewhere. It is a big theme throughout scripture. Jesus as the bridegroom. Um, um, before we get into this book, the Song of Songs, I'm just going to look at a few verses. You don't need to turn there. I'll just read them out. But for example, Isaiah, Isaiah 54 verse 5 says, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. And we see in the Old Testament, sadly because of God's chosen people, Israel, so often they, they, they mess things up. But there's this image of God as the faithful husband and Israel as an adulterous wife. And sin, one of the, um, idolatry, one of the main sins in the Old Testament is often described as kind of adultery, like having an affair. In the New Testament, when Jesus arrives, Jesus is introduced as the bridegroom. Um, John, in John's Gospel, um, and John, John the Baptist, sorry, he introduces as the bridegroom is here. And Jesus himself uses that language. There's this conversation about should they be fasting? And Jesus says the bridegroom is here, referring to himself. And Paul, Paul uses this image, the main one in Ephesians 5, verse 31. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife and the two will become flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And then if we fast forward to heaven, this future glimpse we see in Revelation, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, it says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. So this image has informed, directed throughout history how people have approached this book, the Song of Songs. Let's pray and then we're going to jump in. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that it, it is alive and active and it speaks today. And Lord, it both comforts and it challenges. Lord, will you speak to us now? Lord, we, we want to, we need to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the, the Song of Songs. A well-known but not so well understood book of the Bible. It's, it's eight chapters of love poetry. And you'll see from uh, the, the graphic before you, the illustration, that on the left there's the introduction, top right corner is the conclusion. Um, but it doesn't have any kind of rigid kind of literary design. Um, because it is, it's a collection of poems. And it's not supposed to be dissected or taken apart. It's meant to be read as a flowing whole and, and simply enjoyed. The first line of the book tells us that it is the song of songs. This is a, a Hebrew idiom um, like the king of kings or the holy of holies. Uh, it's a Hebrew way of saying it is the greatest thing. So it is saying this is the greatest song of, of all songs. Then we're told in the first line that, it, that it's a song of Solomon, uh, which could mean he is the author. His name does start the book after all. But it's, actually, this is widely disputed um, because you'll discover as you read the book, the main voice is the voice of a woman, a maiden called the Beloved. Um, and there is a male voice, but it doesn't seem to be Solomon's. Solomon is mentioned a couple of times in the poem, but he's never the main speaker. And we also have to admit that actually he's, he's an odd candidate to be the author of Song of Songs because we know that um, Solomon had 700 plus wives and the book of Song of Songs, the two lovers in Song of Songs, they are the only one 
in the world for each other. So the of Solomon likely means in the, in the wisdom tradition of Solomon. He was known for his wisdom, his poetry, his, his love of learning in every area of life. And so Solomon became the father of wisdom literature in, in Israel. So his legacy here is, is carried on through this collection of love poems that explores the human experience of love and sexual desire. The opening poem introduces us to the, the basic theme of the book. Uh, we hear the voice of a young woman, the beloved, who delights in her man, a shepherd. Uh, now we learn that they're not married yet, but they, they are engaged and they, they cannot wait to be together. It gets pretty heated pretty quickly. Um, from the introduction, the poems flow back and forth. Um, and from the woman's voice to the man's voice, from scene to scene, with, without any kind of, kind of clear linear sequence. And that's why you've got that squiggly line going through your illustration. The, the poems move in these kind of symphonic cycles. And key image, images and ideas, they get repeated and developed. So one of the basic themes uniting the poems that's found in theme one in the illustration uh, is it's the intense desire that this couple they have for one another and it's expressed through this kind of constant seeking and finding so after the opening poem they're separated but they're on the hunt for one another and um, so the woman calls out or she'll wake up from a dream so she'll, she'll go searching for her lover and more than once, they'll, they'll find each other and they'll embrace. And right when things are getting pretty heated, pretty racy, pretty quick, suddenly the scene will end um, and the new one will start and they'll be separated once again and they'll go looking for one another and it, and it goes on like this. Another repeated theme found in uh, theme two of the illustration is, is the, the joy of the couple's physical attraction for one another. Um, so multiple times, They'll pause and they'll describe one another in these kind of elaborate metaphors. Chapter two, uh, sorry, chapter four, verse one. This is one for example. It says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. Your hair like a flock of goats. Your teeth like lambs. Your neck is a tower. Your lips drip honey. Um, now, that all seems rather strange, doesn't it? Um, it's really important at this point to know that these images, these metaphors uh, in Hebrew poetry are not primarily visual. If you were to paint a picture on, on these metaphors, you would um, come up with something looking very, very strange, which is that picture of that weird person, that, kind of, that, that graphic. So you'll read through these kind of poetic cycles, and the tension will keep building. Their desire and joy and attraction, this kind of spiraling repetition is, is a way of heightening and focusing on the mystery and the power of sexual love. It all comes to a conclusion, uh, which pauses to summarize um, the, what the poems are all about. So in chapter 8, chapter 8, verse 6, it says, Love is as strong as death. Its passions are as severe as the grave. Its flashes are a fire, a divine flame. Many waters cannot extinguish it. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If one were to give all wealth of one's house for love, he would be utterly scorned. The, the poems highlight the, the power and intense, intensity of love. It's, that it's both beautiful but, but also dangerous. Like fire, love can destroy if it's abused, but also it can be life-giving if, if it's protected and in the right containment. Ultimately, love expresses the insatiable human desire to be known, to know, and to be des desired by someone else. After this, there's this odd poem about Solomon trying to do what the previous poem said was impossible, and that is to buy love. The woman rejects Solomon's offer. And then the book concludes with the man and the woman once more. They're separated, searching for one another on the hunt. He calls to hear her voice. She begs him to run away with her. And then the book ends. Very open-ended, very abruptly. Just, yeah, totally open-ended. But 
a lot like love. Love never truly concludes because there's always more to discover in love. So love has no end and really neither does this book. Now throughout history, the big question has been about the Song of Songs is what on earth is love poetry doing in the Bible? Um, I've heard it said many times that people who read the Bible for the first time and they came across the Song of Songs and thought, goodness, my Bible has been spiked. What, it, what, what is this? Now, there have been three main interpretations of this book throughout history. Number one, in Jewish tradition, in Jewish tradition, it's been read as a, an allegory. So each character is a symbol. So the woman is Israel, uh, the man is God, and the love is a symbol of, of the covenant between God and Israel uh, at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. This f- flowed into Christian tradition, um, but the characters were swapped, so it's about Christ's love for his people, the church. And this uh, interpretation was inspired by Paul's words uh, in Ephesians 5, which we read at the beginning. So the Christian's husband's love for his wife is a symbol of Christ's love for the church. Now, the interesting thing is, that in the last 100 years, um, archaeological discoveries around Israel's um, ancient neighbors, so that was um, Babylon and Egypt, um, has brought up, turned up all kinds of ancient love poetry, which is very similar in language and style and imagery to the Song of Songs. We see that love poetry was a a meaningful part of Israel's um, cultural environment. This has led most scholars today to view Song of Songs as what it presents itself to be, an arrangement of uh, ancient Israelite love poetry reflecting on the divine gift of love. But that doesn't mean that it's only ancient love poetry. There are key features in these poems that that sticks up when you read them as a whole as part of the Old Testament. There's this overwhelming use of garden imagery. There are powerful echoes of the Garden of Eden, this idyllic scene between the married couple in in Genesis. So the image of the man and the woman, both naked and vulnerable, but united and safe with one another. This resonates in the background of Song of Songs. It's as if these poems are showing us a relationship of love that is untainted by selfishness and sin. So, ultimately, the song holds out hope that even though our relationships on earth are often distorted by selfishness, love is a transcendent gift and it points to a greater love, the love of God, that one day will permeate and transform his beloved world. Because when we discover who God is, when we learn who God is, it's not just that love is not just what he does, it's who he is. It's his nature. And I'm sure there's many of us, maybe you've sat in church, you've sat and we've sang the songs, we've sang about his love. And maybe you're, you're here today for the first time and you haven't heard this, this idea of God's love and his grace. Maybe if you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, you can recite those promises, those memory verses about God's love. But I'm sure I'm not the only one that we can struggle to accept it, can't we? Struggle to digest it, struggle to to rest in it. And growing to become followers of Jesus is not about acquiring more head information, although there is a place for that. There are some fundamental, foundational truths that, that we need to digest, that need to kind of penetrate our souls. And a primary one is the truth of his love. Yeah, we doubt his love. We question it. We feel unsecure about it. It becomes just head information. And we have this disconnect between the head and the heart. Why? Why do we find it so difficult to accept his love? I'm, I'm certain what I see is because we, just the world that we live in, what we're, what we're conditioned to see. The love of God is It's countercultural. He does not love how the world loves. It's like a love like no other. And yet, the love that we often experience in life is the kind of love that both we give and we receive, which is broken and messy and hot and cold and, and inconsistent. 
And it's often conditional. And, and therefore, that's the kind of love that we almost hardwired, that we, we experience. And therefore, we project that onto God that somehow we think he's a bit like that. The human relationships that we experience, we look at these, this, this couple in Song of Songs that seem to be kind of just untainted, as, as a pure love. But then if we compare that to maybe romantic relationships that we see in, in our time and, and our culture, we think that if someone's going to be attracted to us, we think if someone's going to be drawn to us, that we have to be attractive. For us to be desirable, that we, ha- we have to make ourselves desirable. That's, that's the world that we live in. Attractive, so someone will be drawn to us. And that's, that's how dating works, right? I, it's been quite a few years since I, I've, we've been married 15 years to my lovely wife, Jo, but I know dating now, um, a huge part of that happens online, doesn't it? I've got lots of friends who have met, met their, their, their partners kind of online, and I've been told, you know, online dating starts, you know, you, first of all, you have a profile, you have a profile, you have your profile picture, and, you know, it's not just any given photo, is it? It's not, and we like to kind of give the impression, yeah, I look like this every day. But, you know, it's the best picture that's ever been taken of you in your entire life. You know, it's got the best angle, the best light, you're wearing your best clothes. And um, so you have this beautiful picture, and then you have this carefully crafted bio. This carefully crafted bio where, you know, it's a little bit insightful, it's a bit profound, um, but it shows a little good, a good measure of humor to show that you're funny. And then, you know, if it does the trick, if it does the trick, you have hooked someone in. You've managed to convince them to go on a date with you. And you go on this date. And again, when you go on this date, you don't just wear your everyday clothes. You wear you know, your nice, some of your nicest clothes. But it can't be the same clothes that you wore in your profile picture. Otherwise, they'll think you've got one set of clothes, and that's a bit strange. So you're on this date, and you tell your funniest stories, your funniest jokes. And the aim is that, that maybe they might go on a second date with you, and then a third, and then a fourth. And then, further down the line, when they really discover what you're, what you're really like, with your baggage and with your issues like we all have, the hope is that they've seen enough of the good stuff that outweigh the bad stuff, enough so that they might stick around. When I started um, dating my wife, Jo, I remember all the effort of making, getting chocolates and flowers and going for kind of fun day trips. And then when, when we got married, it's not that I gave up trying, but it was, it was the first Christmas. <laughs> I've, I've been told that actually YouTube is down because our, our Wi-Fi is down, so I'm safe. But I think it's been recorded. Okay, um, I'm in trouble. Anyway, so, I, but anyway, it was our first Christmas. It was our first Christmas. And my wife said to me, um, I, wanna, I really want a gift that's practical, something that's useful. I don't want something useless. And I'm, I'm not good at buying gifts at the best of time. But I, I thought I found a great gift. Now, it was a bubble off. I'm not sure if anyone's found what a bubble off. It's by JML. You see them in boots. It's one of these little shavers that shaves your jumper. When you have these little bubbles on your jumper. Um, and I thought, she's going to love this. All these jumpers that have got all these bubbles on, they're going to bring them back to life. Yeah, it, you, I can tell from the laugh that you, you know it didn't go down too well. Um, it wasn't my proudest moment. It's, it's important that we cultivate love. We cultivate desire and, and passion. And my little bit of advice for you, a bubble off does not do the trick. Um, don't go down that route. But we think, we think that we have to be attractive, to be desirable, we have, to, we have to make ourselves attractive. And then when we get it wrong, when we mess things up, that we distance ourselves. So one, the love that we're, we experience, that conditions us. Because God's love is so different than that. It's, it's a love like no other. So we're conditioned by the world that we live in. But secondly, there is an enemy who is actively questioning. He loves us to doubt his love. The enemy that will, will, those little whispers in our ears that say, really, God loves you? How how can God love you when you've done that? When you've done that in the past? How can can God love you when you, you think that, when you think those thoughts? He can't love you. Or maybe when we face hard times, there's challenges, and, and he whispers to us, really? If, if God loved you, he wouldn't allow this to happen to you. The enemy is constantly bringing it into question. He loves to remind us why we're unlovable. I remember my 
one of my first girlfriends when she came around my house for the first time and I didn't want her to get the impression that I was an absolute slob. So I tidied my bedroom. I remember like chucking things under the bed, chucking things in the wardrobe, putting out a Bible so she'd think I was really holy. And then, you know, thinking that she might be attracted to me. But, and we can think that God's like that, that we have to make ourselves desirable, that we have to have it all together. And we go on this dance that when we've done well, when we're, when we're doing okay, we're okay about being in his presence. But then when we've messed up, we've made some big mistakes, we flee from his presence until we can make ourselves acceptable again. And doing that, we miss the heart of the gospel. We miss the heart of the gospel. Like, really? I have to make myself acceptable for God to desire me? I have to make, make myself right that he will be drawn to me? That I have to be on my best behavior so he will stay close? That is not what Jesus accomplished at the cross. We're gonna be sharing communion later where we remember that, that Jesus, he laid down his life for us. He laid down his life and he paid for all the wrongdoings that we have done wrong. And he's not saying, I will do all that. I'll pay for all your wrongdoings, but first, you need to get yourself sorted. You need to get yourself sorted and get it all together. And you have to be on your best behavior for me to stay close. That is not the gospel. God knows that our lives are messy. He knows that our lives are messy. He knows that our thoughts, our minds are broken, are corrupted. He knows that our houses are not clean. There's no hiding things under the bed from him. It's not news to him. He knows our flaws, our mistakes, those things that we have done wrong, that we're so ashamed of, that we can feel so guilty about, we're so embarrassed about. They are, it is not news to God. He's not surprised by that. And yet, knowing all the mess, Knowing all of that mess, he is not running away. He is running towards. He runs towards us. He pursues us. Because here's the kicker. He desires us. He desires you. He desires me. He is drawn to you. He is drawn to me. My friend Andy uses this picture. Imagine this. Um, two, there's a, a couple. A couple who... Uh, they're due to get married, and the, the, the woman is royalty. She is a queen. Uh, she has power. She has position. She has wealth. She has her name. And then there's the man, and the man has had a messy life. He's got debt. He's made some serious mistakes. There's consequences to those mistakes, and yet they love each other. And on their wedding day, they come together, and they tell the promises that, that all couples, the, the, these vows, and she says, all that I have, I give to you. All that I have, I give to you. All of my power, my position, my wealth, my name. And then he comes and he says the same thing back. All that I have, I give to you. All of my mess, all of my mistakes, all of my debt, all of the consequences. And that, is the beautiful exchange of the gospel. The beautiful exchange that he clothes us in righteousness. We're in this wedding season, aren't we? And uh, uh, as a vicar, sometimes I get the, the privilege of doing, uh, doing weddings. And there's this point in the ceremony where um, you've made, the, the, the couple have made the vows, and there's been the declarations, uh, and the, there's been the, the proclamation of the husband and wife and it's an amazing celebration, isn't it? It's not just a celebration of the love then, it's, it's a future love. We're celebrating the future love, these promises that have been made. And there's this point after this, the, after the proclamation, where the, the husband and wife, they join hands together. And if the vicar is wearing uh, robes, he's wearing a, uh, they're wearing a stole, a stole is like a, a vicar's scarf. And in that service, that's the point where the vicar will wrap the stole around the, the hands that are joined. And he says this, he says, those whom God has joined together, let no one put asunder. Kind of saying, no one separate this. No one mess with this. No one get in between these, this couple. And we have a God who through Christ, the bridegroom, is not just saying nobody mess with this. Nobody get in between this. He says, no one can mess with this. No one can separate this. 
Romans 8, 35, nothing can separate us from the love of God. He loves us, he loves us, and he's not going to stop. And yet we doubt it, we question it, but he loves us. When my kids were young, I'm, I'm coming towards the end, because um, I've gone over time. Um, when my kids were young, I've got, I've got two daughters and we've got, got a third on the way. Um, but when my, when my girls were about three, kind of four or five, that kind of age, if we were going somewhere like the shopping center or maybe going, you know, crossing a, a busy road or, go, or going swimming or going to a fair, somewhere where we might become separated, particularly if we were crossing a road, I would, I would say to my girls, guys, it's really important that you hold daddy's hand. We, I, I don't want to lose you. Let's, we're going to hold hands. And because kids are kids, of course, they get distracted. And if for some reason they would let go of my hand, I was not going to let go. I was not going to let go. Why? Because the, the strength of that union together was not coming from them. It was not coming from them. It was coming from me. I am not going to lose my kids. And if I'm like that with my kids, how much more has got that with us? He is not going to let go. And when we mess it up, when we, when we fall short, when we do things we shouldn't have done, he doesn't run away. He runs towards. And God, he, he's... I used to have this narrative over my head that I thought, I heard it so many times, that God loves broken people. And that is true. Please do hear that. God does love broken people. Even though we mess up, he loves broken people. But I kind of thought that was all, like, my identity was that I was broken. When I introduce my wife and my kids to people, I don't say, hey, this is my wife and these are my kids, and they're broken, you know, they've got all these problems and they've got all these flaws. Yeah, in spite of that, I love them anyway. That would be a quick way for me to spend a month on the couch. Um, I, I don't tolerate my children. I don't tolerate my kids. I love my kids. I love spending time with them. And when we get that, when we rest in that, when we digest the love of the Father, that he pursues us and he desires us, that can transform everything. I finish with this. Song of Songs 2 verse 10. Imagine God speaking this over us. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming, blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. The world is desperate to know this type of love. God speaks over us. Arise, my beloved. It's time to rise up. We are his church. We don't go to church. We are the church. And he says, rise up, my beloved. Time is short. Time is urgent. The world is dark. The need is great. And the church needs to shine in the darkness. And he speaks to us and he says, rise up, rise up, my beloved. Amen. Amen.